the Sustainability Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. All right, so I have about 56 slides and I understand I am, I am locked down to an hour with you. So um, I am going to probably speed through some of these slides because I want to get as much as I can. I have two case studies that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So um, with that, off we go. So um, my agenda for today, what I'm going to talk to you about is green engineering, the principles of green engineering, tools and concepts, green remediation, and then, um, like I said, the two case studies. <clears throat> so what is green remediation? And I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to tell me what it is. Just people are supposed to know. They're just too shy. All right. Well, I'm going to have to give them the answer because I need to keep moving. <laughs> I'll give you the US EPA's answer. The US EPA says green engineering is the design, commercialization, and use of process and products in a way that reduces pollution, promotes sustainability, and minimizes risk to human health in the environment without sacrificing economic viability and efficiency. That's pretty lofty, huh? So um, to varying extents, and you guys have probably all experienced this, um, all engineering disciplines generally um, engage in um, some kind of green engineering um, technologies. Um, and some of the um, ideas that they bring in is waste, waste reduction, materials management, pollution prevention, and um, product enhancement. And one of the things you'll find with the green engineering is it's just logical. It's, um, and I'll get to this, it just makes good sense um, in various different levels why you're looking at sustainability and, and, and engineering, green engineering. Um, and a lot of green engineering, you're going to hear this um, from me several different times through this talk tonight. Um, whenever you're looking at green engineering, you're looking at the triple bottom line. Um, it's also called the three E's. Triple bottom line means economics, the environment, and um, social equity. And um, so I showed it with the uh, cute little symbols, but also Right here, it's a social environment economics. So um, I'll show you an example later, and actually they will show those measurements, how they measured the project against that triple bottom line. And you, again, anytime you hear about green engineering, you'll usually see those measures. <clears throat> so the principles of green engineering, um, there's nine of them. I guess it depends on what source. You could probably find many more. But again, they're very logical. Engineering, your engineer processes and products that holistically use systems and analysis and integrate environmental impact and assessment tools. They can serve and improve natural ecosystems while protecting human health and the environment. Um, they use life cycle thinking in all engineering activities. Ensure that the material and energy inputs and outputs are inherently safe and benign as possible. Minimize depletion of natural resources strive to prevent waste, develop and apply engineering solutions while being cognizant of local geography um, and cultures, create engineering solutions beyond current or dominant technologies, improve, innovate, invent. 
to achieve sustainability, and nine, actively engage communities and stakeholders in the development of engineering solutions. So those are general, the, the general principles. So um, one of the tools for uh, green engineering is life cycle analysis. What life cycle analysis is, is basically you're going to look at from cradle to grave the, um, the materials and compounds generated in that process and what they may do to uh, the impacts in the environment. <clears throat> now, um, LCA um, was started in the 1960s. Um, and then in the 1990s, the um, Chemical and Toxicity um, <coughs> Association and then um, the uh, ISO uh, Association also um, made greater developments on this program. And it's basically one of the cornerstones of what is used today for assessing um, uh, green, engine, green engineering. So um, as I mentioned, the International Standard Organization, ISO, um, has a standard on how to run an LCA a life cycle analysis. And basically what you're looking at is, first part of it is you want to look at what's your goal, what's your scope, what are you looking at here, why are you running this LCA? The second part of it is, is you're going to inventory. Um, you're going to look at the chemicals um, that are being generated and that are being used. So is it going to generate uh, greenhouse gas compounds? Is it going to generate CO2? Is it going to generate CFCs? Um, and then, you know, coming up with a, a unit of measure for those compounds so that if you have multiple processes you're evaluating, you can rank those three different or four different processes against each other and then finally come back with an impact assessment. <clears throat> so I um, actually had a little YouTube video clip that actually isn't working right now, but I, I actually thought it was very interesting because I thought about this all the time every time I go in the restroom and then it's an example of um, an LCA of the use of paper towels versus a hand dryer. Um, and I'll save you the, um, the video clip, but basically um, the towels won out and I was actually surprised. And the reason why is because the hand dryer, unless you're actually using green energy, the hand dryer, the CO2, um, causes it to be uh, not as uh, green as the paper towels. So if you ever want to Google it, there you go. Um, another green engineering tool, and I, um, we, I had mentioned this to several of you, is LEED. Does, can anybody tell me what that stands for? Very quiet group. Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Very good, yes. Um, and it's a program that was developed in uh, 1993. Uh, and it started pretty much with just new buildings. It's evolved since then. Um, and there's multiple programs, new cons um, and they're listed right here, new construction, existing buildings, uh, commercial interiors, core and shell, homes, neighborhood, um, and there's a whole bunch of guidelines. And basically how it works is um, there's nine categories that it looks at, um, and that there's a point system assigned to those nine categories. Depending on how you fall out in those points, you can either get LEED certified, LEED bronze, LEED gold, or LEED platinum certifications. <clears throat> and I, I understand next week you're going to have somebody who's going to talk about this a little bit more, I think, if uh, I saw well, the agenda. Next oh. week is Thanksgiving. The following, <laughs> whatever. Your next talk, your next person coming in is going to talk about this yeah, program more. Here next week. Right. <laughs> um, but um, the categories, um, the nine categories, it basically looks at um, the location, you're looking at water efficiency, you're looking at energy and atmosphere, materials reuse, um, connection to um, the community, environmental quality, innovative design. And so all of these categories have points. And what you want to do is in the beginning of your project, you want to plan out where you want to be on those points and then work with all the professionals in your group and make that happen. So, and as we know how that always works out, you know, where you go in in the beginning and how you end up in the end, it's always kind of a little different, but um, that's kind of how that program works. <clears throat> Some other green engineering tools, Energy Star, I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. You go into the appliance store, get a wash machine, dryer, whatever, 
air conditioner. Um, so there's usually some uh, energy savings with that. Um, American Society's chemical engineers, or civil engineers, sorry, has an Envision program, Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. That program is very similar to LEED. It's based on a, a point system. Um, again, it's another means of identifying green or sustainable uh, buildings, bridges, tunnels, and it's more designed for that because it's ASCE. Um, so that's another option if you want to kind of uh, go for points. Um, American Chemical Society, I didn't list all their tools. Um, but they have quite a bit of different um, tools that they look at to use greener, less, less toxic chemicals in the environment. And then US EPA has numerous um, tools that they've recommended for use. So um, into green engineering concepts, I wanted to highlight some of the things that you typically look at. Um, and the first on the list is siting and location. Um, can anybody tell me what a brownfield is? Do you guys know what a brownfield is? Yeah, they do. Some of them actually walk there. <laughs> Isn't it like when uh, when they're rebuilding a location where there is already an existing like facility and they're just renovating it? Um, usually, what happens is it's a it's a contaminated site. Okay. That's are called brownfields. Or abandoned in some cases. It's like really old or it's an old manufacturing facility and typically with old manufacturing facilities there's some level of contamination residual but it could be a uh, manufacturing location that wasn't so vacant but yeah um, so that's a brownfields and so what's a greenfields when you start from scratch basically land that we haven't touched right okay so it's in its natural state be it woods or a field or whatever right <laughs> Okay, oops, flip the side too. Oops, there you go. Oh, I'm going too far. There you go. Um, so, um, siting location. Typically, what you want to do, especially if you're looking at sustainability, and LEED is really big about this, they really like to see you redevelop on a, um existing site that's already been developed or contaminated. Um, and they bring in their own challenges, but um, they definitely, definitely like to see that. Um, and also, one of the examples I have is a brownfields to a greenfields. So it's a, it was a contaminated site that actually reverted back to being um, ecological uh, walking trails and stuff like that. So you're going to love this one. I love it. Anyway, um, transportation. Um, you want to um, look at having fuel efficient, low uh, emissions vehicles, mass transit near your locations. <coughs> Uh, bicycle access, walking access, uh, water and stormwater, you want to look at water reuse. Is our ways to take the rainwater off the roof and use it for irrigation of your plants? Um, uh, flushing toilets. Um, water reduce reduction, so you have low flow um, toilets and sinks and stuff like that. Um, and uh, stormwater reuse, again, reusing your stormwater somewhere on site for some kind of beneficial use. Now materials, um, alternate materials, um, maybe using a material that's not as toxic or as local as opposed to um, one that was originally cited. Um, reusing materials, maybe using something on site that um, was going to get thrown away and now you're going to reuse it as part of your project. Um, recycling, obviously we all like to hear recycling, so instead of throwing away and putting a landfill where it will sit for years to come. We recycle it, and it ends up getting reused in some other process, some other place, and in some other beneficial use. Energy, obviously energy efficiency, whatever we can do to be more efficient, maybe not pump as much water, um, and uh, the utilization of solar or wind to support any kind of activities on site. So those are kind of green engineering concepts. Um, programs, I just touched on these already, LEED, Energy Star, and Vision. Um, so, um, what is green remediation? And I gave you the answer for this one already. It's a practice of considering all environmental effects of a remedy implementation and incorporating those options to maximize net environmental be benefit of a cleanup action. So, I have a picture of an old industrial site, and I asked you about what a brownfield is. That definitely fits the picture there. 
And then it can go to brownfields or uh, a, a greenfields redevelopment or a brownfields uh, redevelopment. So green remediation basically takes the concepts of green engineering and it builds on them further. And what I mean building on them further is basically we, have, we work to improve water quality. We work because a lot of times the groundwater is contaminated and not in just one aquifer zone, but in sometimes in, in, in deeper aquifer zones. Improving soil quality, a lot of times we go to these sites and we've got um, soil issues from leaking underground storage tanks or old manufacturing, multiple years of spills. Managing and minimizing toxics, again, um, trying to make sure we get the lead and the asbestos out of buildings. Monitoring for vapor intrusion. Do you guys know what vapor intrusion is? Yeah. Okay, vapor intrusion. Um, you know, I, I, um, I'm going to skip that one because uh, I want to I wanna make sure I get to the case studies, okay? Um, <clears throat> and reducing emissions of air pollutants and, and greenhouse gases. So again, we're working a little more and we're working deeper because we're actually getting, uh, remediating typically a contaminated site. So the green remediation standard is uh, ASTM method. And um, it's a protocol that basically identifies five core um, areas for best management practices. And the best management practices fall under energy. So you're basically looking to reduce energy. Air, protect the air, reduce greenhouse gases. Water, improve water quality and decrease the quantity of water. Land and ecosystems, conserve, protect, and restore and minimize and reuse um, materials and waste. Sounds very familiar. Doesn't it sound like lead? <laughs> so anyway, um, so um, I wanted to give you some examples of the BMPs that fit under those um, categories that I just gave you. So a, a best management practice would be um, evaluating the use of using a mobile laboratory or a field laboratory as opposed to sending all your samples off for testing at an off-site facility. Um, scheduling activities at appropriate, appropriate seasons, maybe in the summer, as opposed to the winter, where you would have delays. You might be using um, more fuel because it's cold out and you're running vehicles and generators. Um, identifying local sources for energy equipment, uh, efficient equipment, so you're not pulling equipment from California to do a project on the Northeast. Um, establishing electronic networks, so instead of having all kinds of paper and mailing and shuffling paper all around, you maybe you have a SharePoint site and you're sharing and trading documents through that SharePoint site. <clears throat> Reducing travel through teleconferencing. Identifying options for um, renewable energy. So, so again, a lot of these themes are, are like repeating through and through this um, discussion, right? So I got to my case study. <laughs> okay, um, the case study I'm going to show you is um, it's a record corrective action facility in Connecticut. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the background of the site, the community involvement, green remediation alternatives analysis. Uh, well, they actually used LCA, an LCA process. Um, green remediation during the remedy implementation, ecological restoration, and the results. I also want to mention, um, I actually borrowed this uh, presentation. A colleague of mine just presented these slides at the RE3 conference um, in Philadelphia two weeks ago. So you get, you get the benefit of that, that having to go to Philadelphia. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, so it's an 80-acre site. Um, and as I mentioned, it is in Connecticut, um, and it's along a tidal river. So the river is here. There's two rail lines. One runs here, one runs here. There's a highway that runs to the north, and to the south are more commercial sites. Now, you can kind of, this is a, a groundwater treatment plant, and this side of the site is called the west side of the site, and this side of the site is the east side of the site, and the site kind of runs this way. So there was previous, manufacturing done on the site. There was a rec rec corrective action program, and in 1990, they installed a groundwater treatment building, which I mentioned um, there, and they did some um, interim capping of the site. Um, in 2010, they did a corrective measures 
study, and um, they started doing the implementation in 2010 as well. <clears throat> so with the site history, and it's always important to understand the site history before you actually start going through and um, investigating or remediating a site, because it kind of helps you figure out what contaminants you're looking for and where to look. Um, so this site had a history of clay mining and brick manufacturing before it was utilized for manufacturing dyes, pigments, and chemicals. Um, and eventually there was a cessation of operations. But what's really interesting about this site is the clay mining, they, um, when you mine clay, they dug pits. Well, they left these huge borrow pits on the site. And in the days of manufacturing um, in this facility, they actually took their wastewater and they discharged it to lagoons. So they used the borrow pits to put the wastewater in. And then eventually they would go around and clean out the, the um, lagoons and they'd have huge sediment piles um, from cleaning out the lagoons. <clears throat> so this site had uh, lots of lagoons. <clears throat> so the primary causes of contamination at this site were releases from underground storage tanks, the uh, above ground storage tanks and spills, and then the use of the lagoons, which I just told you about, which were for the most part the clay borrow pits, but they did create some other lagoons as well. Um, and then the on-site stockpiling of waste sludges from the lagoons. <clears throat> so um, the site had uh, VOC and SVOC, so volatile organic, I'm, I'm going to lingo, sorry. Volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds um, at the site. So it's chlorinate, um, you know, benzenes, tylenes, that kind of um, chemicals. And there was also um, what we call dense non-aqueous phase liquids. Are you familiar with that term? Yes. It means product, and it sinks. So, you know, um, if you had water and I put the product in it, it would sink to the bottom of the glass. <clears throat> So, and that was in one of the former production areas. There was over a million pat, um, cubic yards of impacted sludge and soil in the lagoon piles. There were shallow groundwater impacts across the site. Um, and then there, um, the site was, um, I talked about a shallow um, aquifer. There was what we call a clay layer, it's called an aquitard. And then underneath the clay layer is another aquifer. That clay layer helped protect that lower aquifer. So most of the contamination was in the upper aquifer zone. What was really important when they um, started doing the um, work at this site back in, in 1993 was to get stakeholder support for the site. This site used to be known as the, when it was a manufacturing facility, the stinky site. I mean, it wasn't very popular with the community. So when they started actually doing the um, corrective measures investigation and um, implementation, they knew they were going to have to get the community involvement and support in this entire process. So they, um, they, got a, they created this uh, citizens advisory panel. They um, worked very hard to demonstrate that the uh, remedy that was proposed for this facility was compatible for the future use um, that the town saw for the site. There were multiple meetings, fact sheets, newspaper articles, open houses, websites, videos. Um, and it, with the picture of the bird here is an osprey. Um, and they had an osprey cam up on the web page. And apparently that, that, web, that web cam got the most amount of hits out of anything. Um, people would always watch the osprey at the site. So as a result from all these um, activities, they have ended up getting full community support for the remedy that was eventually implemented at the site. So the corrective measure study, uh, just um, there were five corrective measures that were looked at for this site, and I'm going to tell you about them a little bit. And the reason why I'm going to tell you about them is because in my next slide, I'm going to show you they basically did what well, we remember talking about the life cycle assessment and or analysis. They basically looked at what the carbon dioxide um, infects were from all five of these. So um, one of the corrective measures they looked at was doing nothing, which is never a very popular option. The second one was um, continue with the existing the measures that were being done, which is the pump and treat and the interim caps. The third one was they were going to cap the site, install a hydraulic barrier wall, 
more groundwater pump and treat, monitor the sediment impacts along the river, and um, contain the denapple. The fourth one was cap, hydraulic barrier wall, groundwater pump and treat, sediment removal. We're going to remove the sediment. Do in situ thermal remediation. Basically, what that is is putting probes in the ground and cooking the contamination. Um, so that was the fourth one. And the fifth one was the same as above, but instead of doing, um, instead of cooking the contamination, um, we're looking at excavation and disposal of the denapple. So basically, they'd be excavating down to 30 feet and digging out all the denapple impacted material. So when they looked at the um, corrective measure study, again, I, I mentioned it was a carbon footprint analysis. So they were looking at for CO2 emissions, on-site and off-site transportation, remedial construction, treatment and disposal, and long-term O&M. So here's the carbon footprint analysis. So this is corrective measures one, um, was basically the pump and treat. And this is corrective measures three, which was the, the caps and the covers. Um, it had the lowest CO2 emissions. The uh, corrective measure number four, which was basically cook it out, um, was yeah, maybe it's the third. And then the corrective measures number uh, five was um, truck it. Um, and five ended up having the highest emissions because of the um, cost of the transportation in and out plus the excavation down to 30 feet. They ended up um, going with this option because then uh, basically the in, in situ thermal uh, remediation cook it out because not only did it um, it wasn't the lowest it was I think the third lowest but it also remediated and addressed the Dean Apple at the site. So the key components of the remedy that was selected at the site, um, so I talked about the east and west side of the site. So to orient you, here's the east, here's the west, here's the line down the middle. So basically there was a one mile long hydraulic barrier wall that was planned to be uh, installed at the site. The waste piles that I talked about, remember the lagoon piles, they were all going to be consolidated. They were going to do ecological enhancements, basically um, make it look pretty again, um, and add walking trails. Then they were going to also go for the sediment removal, the wetland mitigation, and creation. <clears throat> On the west side, this general area here, that pink spot is where the dean apple was. They're going to do the dean apple desorption, and they were going to cap it. So the next several slides is, is what I'm going to talk about the green components for this, green, for this remediation project. So um, the first one is the capping and hydraulic control. Um, so with regard to the capping, they were basically going to take all the soil and sediment and debris and put it underneath the caps of the site. It was not going to be trucked off the site. That, again, that helped keep the CO2 emission um, part down. <coughs> to reduce the flow to the groundwater treatment plant, um, they, it was um, reduced by adding um, the capping and the hydraulic barrier wall so they wouldn't have to pump so much and prevent any kind of groundwater discharge to the river. That was why the hydraulic barrier wall went all the way around the site, and which is an energy reduction. Um, they also went, got, took advantage of material reuse for the hydraulic barrier wall. So the hydraulic barrier wall um, um, was a mixture. Typically, it's mixed with bentonite. They were able to find a um, granulated blast furnace slag um, and it was used as a materials replacement. Um, not only did it make it green and it also made it cheaper, it um, actually improved the high, um, hydraulic conductivity of the hydraulic barrier wall. So the hydraulic barrier wall was um, set to be 10 to the minus 6 um, in permeability and then it would be in 10 to the minus 7 which was even better because that reduced any potential leakage from between the site and the river. Can you see how deep was that wall? 30 feet. So this is just a little cross section showing the capping um, that went across the site and it was 30 um, acres of capping. 
Um, and then they had the wastewater treatment residuals. It was covered with um, geotextile fabrics, two feet of um, fill, and then um, vegetated. The hydraulic barrier wall, here you go. It key, was keyed three feet into the clay. Um, and this is the showing. There's multiple methods for installing a hydraulic barrier wall. I don't know if you guys have taken your, um, and I think it would be geotech they do hydraulic barrier walls. Anyway, um, they end up doing um, a um, trench mixing method. And so basically they took the slag that came in these hoppers, um, they brought the hoppers over and pumped the fluid into the um, excavation and the backhoe basically just mixed the material. Um, so the second green component, in situ thermal remediation. The EPA wanted um, the deed and apple removed and they didn't um, identify a specific remediation cleanup standard. They just said in their order, remove as much of the deed and apple as you could. So um, it gave them a little bit of flexibility to play with the in situ thermal re remediation method. They ended up selecting a temperature of 100 degrees C, played around with the temperature up and down. They found out the 100 degrees C was the best as far as um, destruction of the contaminants um, and, uh, and you know, recovering any of the contaminants. They just got diminishing returns from higher temperatures. Um, another green component they had on this um, in situ thermal um, was they actually used solar power air monitoring equipment during the process of monitoring for VOCs. Um, and I was actually talking to my coworker about this, and they said, you know, we use solar, but because the site was remote and there was no power, it actually made the most amount of sense because these sites were, you know, remote around the site. So this is the in-situ thermal remediation, what it looks like. So this is the general location in which it was installed. So you put in the heater wells. The heater wells went down to the target treatment zone, just above the clay. Um, and then you had a uh, vapor recovery. And from the vapor recovery, you can imagine, you know, you're heating the subsurface to 100 degrees C. When it comes up, you're going to end up having a condensate, especially in the winter. So the condensate um, went off to the groundwater treatment plant. They did recover some amount of product. For the most part, it got burned off. But I think they said they only recovered about a, a drum of product. The system ran for six months and it achieved its goal and they shut it off. So the other advantage of this process is it's quick. <clears throat> so the, um, when they use this um, technology, they did a pilot study in a demonstrated area, is about a quarter of an acre. Um, full fledged impl um, implementation was an acre. This is the groundwater treatment. So this is, it's kind of opposite of what, this is the west side of the site and this is the east side of the site, You're looking at it backwards. So the third grade component was the ecological enhancements. So they did stormwater management, we talked about this before. Stormwater management to, um, they used the stormwater to support the wetlands. They constructed inland wetlands area, um, and I have a picture of that. Um, and they um, removed the, soil, the impacted soil from the um, tidal wetlands. They created ecological enhancements. They added plants and, and trees and shrubs and seeded. Um, they did the sediment removals and they created the walking trails for future recreational and educational use. So this is the wetlands construction. They actually used um, a clay enhanced geotextile um, liner for the wetlands area. And the reason why is we had shallow groundwater contamination, and here we are constructing a wetland. We didn't want to have the ground, shallow groundwater come up and recontaminate our brand new wetlands. So they used this impermeable geotextile material um, to create those wetlands. But there's some shots of what it looks like. Um, and just some more pictures of um, the ecological restoration. So it's pretty nice looking, huh? You'd never imagine that was the stinky, smelly slate nobody wanted. <laughs> um, and so um, if you build it, they will come, and they did. I'm sure the Canadian geese weren't so much loved, but you know.
But the osprey, the turtles, the bunnies, the skunk family, so the wildlife is returning to the area, which is nice. And again, the ecological restoration walking trails, there's about a mile and a half of trails that were generated. Um, you can see the various different loop trails. And there's also an educational center that was created for the site. Um, and they're working on getting the trails open and start having educational tours. So, you know, what a great idea. You come home from work, you know, you had a bad day. I need to go for a walk. <laughs> sediment removals. Um, I mentioned they had done some sediment removals in two areas. So there was um, two isolated areas up here and on the river and then one on the creek. It was 20, 2,700 cubic yards of material that was taken out. And again, it was put um, back on the site and underneath the cap. And then they restored those um, wetland areas. So the fourth green component is contract management. I kind of think of it as more administrative controls. Um, and again, this is very much a lead concept. They um, really worked too hard to use local labor, local materials, local sources. Um, and they tracked their local spending. So they had greater than 40% of their construction contracts were were local. Um, and you know, again, it was not only good for them, but it also supported the community and got the community more involved with the project. So the property end use, um, 60 acres, two thirds of the property, that's part over here, is tidal marshes, uh, and it's, it's an ecological reserve. And then the remaining 17 acres up over here, um, is eventually going to be capped and um, redeveloped into light industrial use. So we talked earlier about the ASTM standard for um, green cleanups. That standard came out in about 2010. That was about the same time that they got their corrective measure study approved and started doing the implementation. EPA came um, to the people involved in the project and asked them to consider using this and, and working the site around it and see, you know, see how it would come out. And um, so they agreed to do it. And it worked out really kind of neat because um, remember I told you about the triple bottom line, the three E's? So environment, social, economic. So they ended up with 87 green best management practices, nine social, and eight um, economic BMPs. And the EPA was like really happy with how it came out. And it's always good to keep the EPA happy, by the way. Um, sometimes you don't disagree, you disagree with them, but in general. Um, so um, there's a, a discussion about this site up on Clue In. Um, you can go look it up. And uh, it talks about all the, um, a lot of the facets of what I just told you about. They ended up getting uh, an award um, from the Connecticut DEP on uh, green sustainability for how the project was redeveloped. And um, so future site activities, they plan to cover the remaining 17 acres, that's the west side, and do the redevelopment. Open the trails to the public. They're planning on adding solar power for the groundwater treatment plant. That makes it a little bit more greener. Um, and then, you know, the site redevelopment. Site uh, results and lessons learned. They said community outreach was essential, and I think, yeah, if you have community having problems, they didn't like the site, I, I, yeah, it's essential. Um, <clears throat> green remediation elements, again, the regulatory negotiations, the feasibility uh, evaluations, your design. Um, and the, the other feedback was the share of the accomplishment, which is the awards, talking at RE3, telling you about it really kind of neat. So, um, okay, and so case study two. Do you, does anybody want to ask me any questions about case study one before I launch into case study two? Yeah. I was just wondering, like, who was, like, responsible for, like, starting that whole cleanup process? The responsible party. Okay, so yeah. whoever was... Yeah, this, yeah, it was definitely, yeah, because it was rec, it was a record corrective okay. action. Yeah, yeah. Probably before you were compare, uh, talking about the different treatments for the DNAPL, um, and then you were comparing the carbon, um, 
But what about the costs? Like, is there a budget that you guys have to play by? I, um, unfortunately, um, you know, when you um, work with EPA, cost sometimes is not, um, sometimes it's about, you know, carbon footprint and and getting it cleaned up, and what's going to get it cleaned up? Because you're right, um, ISTR is very expensive. Um, but you know, they um, when they were checking off, it wasn't going to be local. Um, I understand it had to go to whole Ohio, so that's pretty expensive too. So, so uh, when the ISTR was selected, was it primarily because of the nature of the d -Naple? the particular product that was there or the overall uh, contamination that happened in the entire site? Um, the ISTR, it was um, a hot spot area that needed to be addressed. Okay, so it was specific. For It was specific. Um, I have to tell you, I'm sure they looked at other technologies to address it. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the other technologies they looked at, okay. but they decided to go forward on a pilot with that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? I'm not sure. Another 15 minutes. Okay, I think I can do this. <laughs> okay, case study number two. Um, this is actually a project I'm working on right now. And it's local. It's in New Jersey. It's not far from here. <laughs> um, it's seven and a half acre site, and it's made up of three lot and blocks. There's one lot here, one lot here, one lot here. <clears throat> and the site was utilized for manufacturing back into the 1930s. The environmental investigations began in 1985 um, as a result of property transfer and New Jersey's property transfer regulations which require if you transfer property or you have a succession of operations, meaning you stop manufacturing, you need to do an investigation. And um, that's how the work on this site began. Um, and um, just take my word for it, this entire site was covered in e equipment or buildings, manufacturing facilities. Um, so one of the key things I also want to point out here is the river. Um, because some of the work that um, we're going to be doing, uh, or we're going to be talking about, involves the river. and. We have um, a lot of wetlands regulations, flood hazard area regulations that we have to comply with um, in those areas, and it makes it a little bit more challenging. So this is a picture of the site um, from the um, southwest corner of the site. Um, and what I'm showing you is um, these are all the old concrete um, slabs which hold held um, above ground storage tanks or other various vessels at the site. And take my word for it, although this looks green, it's all concrete. Um, what we're finding is years and years of organic debris falling on it, just collected. We actually had trees growing in it. Um, but when we started clearing up all the debris, there was concrete. That big blue building um, used to be part of the facility. That's that other lot. Uh, back. Oh, here. That's this building here. So uh, that picture is from here. Um, <clears throat> so these two site, these two lot and blocks have been sold off, and the only lot that's left that needs to be remediated is this lot. A lot of the work on those other two lots and why they were sold off, there was underground storage tanks and some isol some spill areas and stuff. Those were all addressed and remediated, which allowed them to sell them off. Um, there was some residual contamination that was left there. Okay, so more pictures of the site. And yeah, it's not very exciting, and it's been like that for many, many years. Um, and this is, I was telling you about the site history. Um, so there was 13 areas of concern. So what is an area of concern? Area of concern is basically an area where there was a manufacturing operation that was conducted or um, like an underground storage tank. 
points of discharge, things like that. This site had 13 areas of concern. We're down to two. And one of them is the riverbank soil right here and the shallow groundwater, which ranges all through here. So um, what I'm trying to, um, so the soil at the site, as I mentioned to you, a lot of the hot spot areas were cleaned up and remediated. The remaining parts of the soil are going to be addressed through a deed notice or an institutional control. Do you guys, are you familiar with what that is? No. Yeah. Okay, I'll, um, basically what that says is New Jersey allows you to leave a certain amount of contamination and you write into the, the deed, especially on an industrial site, you write into the deed that the contamination is present and there's an asphalt cap that means maintained at the site. If they ever do anything at the site, they know that they're gonna have to take additional measures to deal with the potential soil impacts at the site. So all three lot blocks have a deed notice on them. So the soil, that's how that's addressed. The groundwater is another issue. Basically, we're getting ready to um, deal with a, installing a hydraulic barrier wall, much like that other site. This hydraulic barrier wall is still in design, and it's probably going to be, this construction type is going to be quite different than the other one. Um, the other one they installed with a backhoe. This one's probably going to be installed with um, augers. Um, we're going to need to install uh, extraction wells to recover the contaminated groundwater. Um, once we get the hydraulic barrier wall in and um, discharge it. Basically our goal is to convert the site from basically concrete structures and it's been sitting like that for years into a parking lot for lease or sale. It's, I know it's not very exciting. It's not as glamorous as the other one. But this is the reality of kind of what all these projects are. <laughs> um, and it makes a lot of site sense for the area. Um, the area is, um, if you go down there during working hours, there is no place to park. Um, and I think it would be a great relief to the area to have um, a couple of acres of parking back there. So this figure I'm showing you is um, where all the deed notices are, or the restricted areas is part of the deed notice. So these areas are where there's some soils that are, are above New Jersey's requirements. And they're all covered with asphalt except for, for this one, which we're working on, which is the river bank. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the remedial challenges and plans. And by the way, that's a picture of the site probably about a week or two ago. Um, yeah, a lot of concrete. Um, so the soil, need, the soil near the river needs to be addressed, which I mentioned to you. Um, we've had to get new, um, wetlands permits, flood hazard area permits. Um, they take months to obtain if you've ever talked to anybody. The state of New Jersey is very challenging about what they like to see in those. Um, there's lots of concrete to move. So like I said to you, that, that one lot down on the bottom, we're basically going to take out all that concrete because we need to take the site down uh, four feet, three or four feet, regrade it so that we can construct the parking lot sub base. We, this site is not really good for taking the contaminated soil and putting it underneath the cap because we need to cut the site. Um, so all the concrete and all the soil is be, um, being taken off site um, for recycling. It is being recycled. Um, so we're, we get green stars for that. It's not as green as the other one. The, um, from the groundwater standpoint, the uh, hydraulic barrier wall design is still in process. Um, we're still trying to figure out um, what that hydraulic barrier wall is going to look like. We're also still trying to figure out um, where we're going to do with the water, where we're going to discharge it to, and how it's going to be treated. But I can tell you this, the groundwater treatment building, because it's in a flood hazard area, has to be above the flood level. So that was yet another tricky thing. How do you build with a flood, uh, you know, a groundwater treatment building in a flood hazard area? Um, and so we looked at having a building in a building. We called it a box in a box. So the outside um, part of the building would stop the water from going to the inside of the building. Um, and we looked at several other options, but what we resolved to is 
Basically, it's going to be a, a building on stilts where the bottom level is going to be designed flood. And we're going to have water vessels, water treatment vessels that probably span the base level up to the first level, the mezzanine, that can um, take the flooding. But most of the operational material is going to be on the first floor. And so if it floods, it's never going to affect our, our groundwater treatment system. But our challenge is, is what to do with the water. Um, do we discharge it to surface water? Do we discharge it to the river? Do we inject it? And so we're doing all kinds of studies trying to figure out what to do with our water. Um, but it's moving right along and it's very exciting for a lot of us because the site has been like that first picture I showed you for way too long. <laughs> so. Do they decide like, what kind of treatment you're going to do there? Um, the groundwater for the, the treatments um, trained for the um, groundwater. Mm -hmm. We're still working on that. It, it first started as error stripping and carbon but we're having issues with um, treatability if we're going to just charge to surface water. Some of the stuff that we have to do is toxic to the microorganisms. So we don't have a wetland to build into. So we're actually looking back into um, injection back into the groundwater and using that to our advantage to capture more of our groundwater plume. So pretty much another form of pump entry? Uh, yes, but we're going to use it to channel and stop maybe some of the plume yeah, and get it to come up. to us. Barrier, right? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Hydraulic barrier, that would be a perfect word for it. Yep. But it's still in, still in discussion. How am I doing? I got five minutes for questions? Yeah, see. Okay. All right, thank you.